Hear us as we come. Hear us as we
I'll meet you there in just a moment. I'm going to read a verse here found in Exodus 34, 6 through 7. And here's what it says. God said, I am the Lord God. The Lord God is who is merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth and keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children, even to the third and fourth generation. Now my text, which is found in, <coughs> excuse me, 1 Samuel 17, just one verse. I'm reading for you, for you a more modern translation. And when King Saul, Saul, saw David going out against Goliath the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, who is the father of this young man? Who is the father of this young man? You see, David was 15 years old, approximately 15 years old or even younger, when he stepped on a battlefield against a giant by the name of Goliath. And even the king and the king's army wondered, who is the father of this young man? Focus on the family founder, James Dobson, said this. He said, the Western world stands at a great crossword, crossroads in its history. It is my opinion that our very survival as a people will depend upon the presence or absence of masculine leadership in the home. For fathers hold the key to the preservation of the nuclear family. According to the U.S. Department of Cens Census, as of 2013, 43% of U.S. children live without their natural father. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. Daughters of single parents without a father are, without a father involved are 53% more likely to marry as teenagers. And 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. And 71% of pregnant teacher, teenagers lack a father. On the good news front, children with fathers who are involved are, likely, are less likely to drop out of school or fail a grade and are more apt to get A's and engage themselves in extra curriculum activities. Amen. You see, all this brings to light the critical role of a father in the whole. I want to say to you fathers here on Father's Day that you are the key to what God wants to do in your home. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. 
Do you know that the root word from which we get the word father means the founder, the foundation, the author. That's what the word father means in the original. You see, Father, you are the author of your home. You are the one who originates and gives existence to what is created in your home. That's what God says. I'll read that again. You are the one who originates. You are the author. You are the one who originates and gives existence to what is created in your home. And God has given you a great privilege and a great responsibility as fathers and as authors of your homes. A responsibility to love your family. A responsibility to lead your family. And a responsibility to lift your family in the things of God. Somebody say amen. 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 How many of you are with me this morning? Amen. How many of you got to bed late last night? Uh, oh, shame on you. <laughs> How many got up early and prayed? Amen. God bless you. Amen. You ought to always come prayed up when you come to the house of God. You say, why? Because you can hear a little better. <laughs> That's really the truth. Ask God to anoint your ears to hear what He wants to speak into your life. And He will. Fathers, God says to you that you are to love your family. Now, God created man and woman in His image or His likeness. But he put different attributes of himself in both of them. Together, mothers and fathers are like a fine balance and representation of God. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. You see, we see some of God's attributes reflected in the nature of a woman. That unconditional love, that extreme patience, not at all like us. Deep pain and suffering, <laughs> nurturing care, and many more. And those are very different from the nature of man that God has given us. The nature of a man is to be a provider, and a protector, and a teacher, and a disciplinarian, and a leader, and an example for the family. And that's a pretty big list in its own self, isn't it? Someone said that a child is not likely to find the father in God unless he finds something of God in his father. Amen. Amen. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Yes. I didn't write it. That's true. You know, a preschool class was gathering in, for Sunday school. And the teacher asked them to draw a picture of God. So the, the children began to make all kinds of pictures, some were of rainbows and, and kind of big smiley faces in the sky, and others had men with really big hands reaching out. But there was a little girl called Sarah, and she drew a picture of a man with a suit and tie. Now the teacher was a little little shocked to see that Sarah would draw a picture of God as a man in a suit and tie. And so she said, Sarah, why, why did you draw that? She said, I don't know what God looks like, so I drew my daddy instead. You know how desperately our homes need the influence of a godly father. Amen. Hallelujah. God gives us a model of a godly father, a model of himself in the story of the prodigal son. I won't take the time to read it, but if you have your Bible, you can look at it in Luke 15, 20 through 24. You see, a godly father loves his family, and his love is not self-seeking, and that love is not self-serving love. But it's a, it's a sacrificial love. Amen. It's a devoted love. Amen. Like Christ has for his church. A father 
father's love is expressed in the way he provides for his family. It is love that does, causes him to do his best to provide well for his family because of the father's efforts in the story of the prodigal son, both sons enjoy the prospect of a bright future. You see, our Heavenly Father promises provision for those that are His own. And His very name, Jehovah Jireh, means the Lord who provides. Right. And He expects that if we are His, that we should be providing for our own. Somebody say amen. To amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now I will tell you, I see a lot of young men who are able to have children in our day and age, but many who are unwilling to provide. What a shameful thing. 1 Timothy 5 8 says that anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You see, a father's love is expressed in the way he provides for his family, but also in the way he protects his family. You see, love is a love that protects, it protects from the corruptions of life from without and from within but also it is a love that lets go the father of the prodigal son didn't attempt to stop his son he allowed him to go and stand on his own or maybe even fall but he did so in love. He advised his son. And though he was ignored, he was quick to aid him in a time of need. To lift him back upon his feet. Because he protects his family. A father's love is expressed in the right exercise of authority. It's a love that exercises authority with grace. It finds that right balance of discipline and correction and peppers it with grace. <laughs> and the implica implication of the scripture is that it is the responsibility of the father to initiate and develop a loving communion in his home. That's right. <laughs> you should be telling your son and daughter that you love them. Sometimes men have a problem with expressing themselves. I cannot relate with that. I know that when I was young, it was difficult me, for me to kind of talk that way. And yet as I have grown older, I find it very easy. Because you walk through life, you grow up, you learn. You begin to see life with a different perspective. But you must say, even when you are uncomfortable, you must tell your family members that you love them. You must share that from your lips. And you will find, fathers, the more you do, the more you will build up your family. Somebody say amen. Amen. Fathers, God says then to love your family, but he also says to lead your family. God has not only called us to be lovers, but He has called us to be leaders as well. And He has commissioned the Father to be the spiritual leader in His home. God calls men to be responsible. And we will be held accountable to God on how we have led our family. It has been well documented that the decline and fall of the Roman Empire was largely due to a diminishing availability of strong male leadership. And I will tell you there's a dearth in that in our land today. Amen. Men are not standing up 
to be men and to be fathers. And they're leaving off their responsibility. And that should never happen in our homes. God tells us to lead our family. God's plan for you as a father is to let him lead you as you lead your family to him. You see, you a person who is under authority is the only person who can rightly exercise authority. You have to be under the authority of God, and then others can be under your authority. Amen. Somebody say amen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. See, when you are under the authority of God, then I will tell you, you're going in a good direction. And others will want to follow. A godly father leads his family by example. It is a leadership that causes others to want to follow. It is not do as I say, but do as I do. They need to see you reading your Bible. They need to see you or hear you praying and observe you living a life of faith. You see, if you don't show the example, they will not follow it. It's not what you say. It's what you live. Amen. General Eisenhower, I read that he was often willing to demonstrate the art of leadership by using a piece of string. He would put the string on a table and he said, pull it and it will follow wherever you wish. Push it and it will go nowhere at all. That's true. And that's exactly the example of true leading. You be the example, and they will follow. A godly father leads his family by upholding a righteous standard. Good fathers are strong men, men who display moral and spiritual character. You see, anybody, anybody can be corrupt. But it takes a man to stand up and do right. Amen. It takes a man to be a person of integrity in your home and outside of your home. I heard uh, a woman in her 30s say, and I, in fact, I read it online. Here's what she said, you know, I don't have a husband and I don't have a boyfriend. It seems very difficult to find one because she said, all I meet is boys. There aren't many men these days. And she wasn't talking about age. She was talking about men standing up and being men as God called them to be a strong support of moral and spiritual character. And men who strive to teach their children to love and to fear and to honor God and to then therein reap the blessing that God has. You see, God says that we are the catalyst, that we are the glue that pulls the family together and points them towards God. Are you doing that? Are you giving that responsibility to your wife because you have absented yourself from it? The scripture says that is our job. We are the author of the home. We are the foundation of the home. We are the catalyst. And God says that we should raise a righteous standard knowing that if our children don't stand for something, they will fall to anything. anything. When you and I, fathers, have a high standard, it helps our children grow wise, to be wise and make mature choices. And if you look around our world, you can see how many young men are not wise and not making good decisions. And I will tell you, it is because more likely than not, they come from a family in which the father is not a strong leader. 
and not standing up for righteousness. You see, righteousness not only exalts a nation, but it exalts a son and a daughter as well. A godly father leads his family with consistency. You see, God calls fathers to have a consistent example. A consistent standard of righteousness in his life that he upholds. It is the genuineness and the stability of the faith that he has that makes his leadership have it a lasting effect. Those fathers who are up and down and all around are not leading anyone. Amen. At least not in a good direction. Amen. See, God wants us as fathers not only to love our family and lead our family, but to be consistent at that. And if you want to have an in, a true impact on your family, on your church and your homes, then that's what you have to do. Lastly, fathers, God says that we should love our family, that we should leave our family, and lastly, that we should lift our family. There was a young Jewish boy who grew up in a small town in Germany. His father was a hero, and he hung on every word that his father said. And his family revolved around the synagogue where he was reared to worship and to serve God. And one day, his father came home and announced that he was changing the religion. And the boy was shocked. He didn't know what to say. He asked. Him. He said, uh, Dad, why, why are we changing religions? And his father said they were changing religions because it will be good business for us. And that boy grew up and moved to England. Over time, he wrote a book and developed a worldview that eventually came to dominate one half of the world's population. The name of the book was Das Kapital, and the author was Karl Marx. And in the book Karl Marx wrote, he said this, I learned from my father that religion is the opiate of the people, and that God is really not all that important. Mm -hmm. And because of one father's fatal decisions, wars were fought, Blood was shed, lives were lost, nations were ruined, and millions were sent to a godless and Christless grave. Mm -hmm. wow. Don't underestimate the influence of a father in the home. See, God expects fathers to love their family, lead their family, and lift their family up to God. A godly father lifts his family up by praying for them. Do you pray? Do you pray for your children? Do you pray for your wife? Do you intercede on their behalf? We lift them up when we pray for them. We lift them up when we are patient and forgiving in spirit. You lift up your family when you exercise patience in the face of wrong choices. Like God is patient to us. How many of you have been provided a second and a third and a fourth chance? How many of you have gone beyond that? Lying is a sin. <laughs> Lying is a sin. How many of you have gone before uh, after that, how many times have you look at your life and you can't say, I gotta tell you, I have to go like this? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just me. We must be quick to forgive, and when asked, we cannot hold any grudge. Be what? Because that's the kind of love that God has reflected towards you and me, isn't it? A godly father lifts his family by affirming their value in the home. 
I want to tell you, if you keep telling your son or daughter that you are proud of them, they will make every effort to give you a reason to be proud of them. Yes. Yes. Did you hear that? Yes. We need to be more diligent to build our family esteem and to let them know how valuable they are to God and to us. But mostly, a godly father lifts up his family by being there for them. I was reading a story. In 1989, there was an earthquake in Ar Armenia. The earthquake only lasted four minutes, but 30,000 people lost their lives. A father rushed to his son's school. Immediately after the earthquake, and he found that it had completely co collapsed. He looked at what was, what was left in the school and the father remembered that he had made a promise to his son just that very morning when he dropped him off at school. And he, he looked into his son's eyes and he said this, Son, no matter what, I will always be there for you. And that promise he made that very morning went over and over and over in his mind. Looked like a hopeless situation. But he remembered that his son was in the back right corner of the building. That's where his class was. So he rushed there and started digging with his bare hands through the rubble. And as he was digging, other grieving parents arrived. And they were so overwhelmed. And they said to him, listen, it's too late. You can't help them. They're all dead. This isn't going to help. Even a police officer and a firefighter came and tried to discourage him, but the man only began to dig more furiously. Amen. He needed to know for himself that his son was dead or alive, and he dug for 38 hours. And on the 38th straight hour, he pulled back a boulder, and he screamed the name of the son. And he heard a voice. Dad, is that you? Jesus. It's me, Dad. It's me. Once his father had dug his son out of the rubble, he held him in his arms and tears rolled down his face. The young boy looked up to the face of his father and he said, Dad, I told all the other kids they didn't have to worry. I told them that if you were alive, you would save me. Remember, Dad? You promised that this morning. Dad, you said that no matter what, you'd always be there for me. And here you are, Dad. You kept your promise. You see, your father is the author, the foundation, the family. God calls us to love our family, lead our family, lift our family in the things of God to a greater spiritual life. It's time that we pick up our responsibility as authors of our family. It's time that we form the foundation upon which our family can stand and declare like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. We buy your heavenly. God, I know there's not a father here that cannot see his faults and failures as a father. 
Now we're so imperfect. So many times we have said the wrong thing. We have done the wrong thing. We have failed to be gracious. Failed to show the kind of love that there ought to be at work in our home. Father, we fail sometimes to be that leader, to be that example that would cause our son or daughter to want to emulate us. We come to you today in the name of Jesus. We come in the power of your might. For of ourselves we recognize that we can never love or lead or lift our family up into good places in life apart from the abiding presence and grace and assistance that we can find in you. God, we love our family. Yet sometimes we fail to show it as clearly as we desire to. And so I pray you give grace to the men who are here in our community, to the men who are watching this on television or right here in our own sanctuary. I thank you that you are our Father, O oh God, and you have given us an example that is perfect, an example that is true and right, an example that brings blessing and benefit and honor to our family. God, we want to provide. We want to be those leaders. We want to be those men of faith, strong, in the place of difficulty. We want to be that person who's sensitive in times when sometimes our anger goes out of control, that we can be that father that reflects a picture of you. And I pray today that as we gather here in your presence, that above all things, that we will always be there for our family. And that we'll always be there. And that we'll be that pillar of strength and help that you've called us to be. I am the God that he led me, I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. This is the God's word. is more powerful than any disease you can name tonight. You might have received a horrible report from the doctors and told you your disease is incurable. But you know what? There's hope tonight. There is hope because God's promised that He would heal us.